It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the third in the series of eight of the CARICOM Girls in ICT Partnership STEM STEAM career webinar series. The theme for which is empowering young women in the digital age. This is an initiative aimed at providing career information to both young women and young men to explore and take up careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which include digital careers. Digital technologies, as you know, underpin all we do in today's world, and so we must help to prepare the next and current generation to make the most of these tools, and this includes having access to new, exciting career choices in STEM, STEAM, ICT. Today, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce to you the moderator of the session, who will be Dr. Gunjan. Man Singh, and she will take us through the rest of our proceedings, and I will help her to close off the webinar at the end. Dr. Man Singh is the head of the department and a senior lecturer in the Department of Computing at the University of, of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. She holds a PhD in Information Systems, and she teaches various courses at both the undergraduate and graduate level in computer science, information systems, and data science, which includes uh, business intelligence, programming, artificial data, visualiz data visualization, knowledge discovery and analytics. She has a number of accomplishments and she's the co-author of a book called Business Intelligence for Small Medium Enterprises and the co-editor of another book titled Knowledge Management for Development. She has a wide range of experience, is totally committed and uh, uh, engaged with empowering women and youth around uh, STEM and the digital technologies and is also an active member of our partnership. So it is my delight to hand you over to Dr. Man Singh today to take us through uh, the webinar. Thank you and over to you, uh, Unjan. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I didn't think that the moderator needed so much of an introduction. <laughs> but we have some great presentations today, you know, as everyone knows, this is the STEM career series that we are having every week. And it's, we had a fabulous, um, you know, start last week, and this is our second um, lecture in our, uh, in that series. So we are very happy to have Candice and Joshua. Um, not sure if Joshua has joined in, but he's having some issues. And if he's not there, he, we have his talk. So we will play his talk. So, um, so on agenda, we basically first have uh, Candy's talking and then Joshua and then Jennifer will have a question answer session, which I hope all our participants can uh, participate in that and they have the questions ready. So let me um, uh, let me introduce our um, you know, speaker today, who is Candice Denick. Candice um, is a research and development leader at Google, and she has done her BA in environmental studies and creative writing and masters in information systems from Carnegie Mellon University. She's a people-focused analytics leader with 10 years of experience in industry, and she has a proven track record of success in delivering results, managing teams, and influence, influencing, influencing clients. And what I'm even seeing on the screen that she was born in Trinidad and Tobago. So she's very much a Caribbean person. And she's working at Google. And uh, at Google, she has prioritized and delivered over $450 million you know, dollars across businesses, influenced highly matrix clients and aligned cross-functional teams to scale analytics, which is so powerful, and measurement frameworks across the global business organizations. She has also managed a team of 21 marketing science leads, created collateral and research frameworks, and coached teams through analytics. Candice has deep understanding of the advertising industry and is skilled in using data to drive business decisions. She's also an effective communicator and collaborator and Candice, we're just you know, waiting to see how you communicate with us. And she has many accomplishments. There are many on her CV, but the one I would like to single out is that she has built a mentorship group to coach and retain 30 black analysts across Alphabet, which is the new name for Google. 
saving Alphabet $1 million in attrition costs. And I think also making the career of all those you know, analysts who she is coaching and uh, mentoring. Candice is passionate about using data to make a positive impact on the world. And I now invite Candice Denick to actually give her presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Lovely to meet you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so as Gunjan mentioned, I have about 10 years of experience, uh, both digital and offline experience in marketing. Um, you've heard my degrees that I have. Uh, ahead of that, I love hiking and traveling and listening to Brazilian music. So let me present. Um, so I'm super excited to talk to you all today about building out your tech portfolio. Let me, one second, sorry, I'm having some trouble presenting. Okay. Um, question if can I possibly send you my presentation if it's not coming up? Sure, who would you want to send it to? Can you send it to um, the uh, email that you have? I do use it or ICT for these styles, please. Okay, thank you. All right, one second, everyone. Sorry about that. I'm on a Mac, so it has weird permissions but I am excited to talk to you all today about this topic. And as we are just getting the presentation ready, meaning what I, you know, this uh, webinar series, career webinar series is on STEAM and STEM. And, uh, you know, from your background in your environmental studies and, and creative writing, and, you know, from that, the A, and then, then the information systems, you really have done the STEAM bit, Candice, haven't you? Yes, yeah, so that's exactly what I want to talk about. Um, so having a background, I did my undergrad in environmental studies and creative writing, like you mentioned, and transitioned over to tech and information systems. It really helped shape and influence the way I think. Um, it's a massive advantage. So I definitely encourage folks who want to study humanities to definitely do so, because I've noticed that it helped me think in a way that's different from my colleagues um, and solve problems differently. Um, and more strategically, to be honest. So it's definitely an advantage. So don't forget the A in STEAM. <laughs> that, that's what I couldn't help noticing in your uh, CV. You know, the, the, the A actually laid a foundation for many things. Yes. And it's definitely, I think, more and more people are realizing that it's an advantage in the workplace now. So hopefully we see some more change in that direction. Right. And I think it's a good thing to also see that it's not, not just about the techies who would be working in a Google. There are other aspects of managing a technology uh, business, which becomes so powerful. Yes, definitely. Especially as you want to move in, move up. So when you start off, it's very important to have, um, if you want to work in tech, hands-on keyboard skills to know how to code and do other things. As you move up, and truthfully, even now in my role, I don't code as much as I used to. Um, so you need to have soft skills become more and more important as you move up into management and other roles, especially people skills and understanding how people work. Excellent. I don't know. How, you have. I presume you have emailed the presentation. Yes, I have. I am hoping you think I can bring it up soon. I so, see her in here. Yeah, she's here. Um, so tell us even, you know, a little bit about uh, your journey from um, from Trinidad. So you grew up in Trinidad <laughs> and you went to U.S. to study, I presume? No. So I, um, I I grew up in the U.S. I left Trinidad when I was young. I was about five. And so I've lived here for over 20 years now. Um, I can probably hear it from my accent. I will be back for Christmas, though. So I'm very excited. You know, when um, you started, I thought I could hear the Trinidadian accent, but now that you've started talking a bit more, you lost it. <laughs> I did lose it. <laughs> so I, think I, see the, I see the presentation is up, so I'll be quiet and handing over to you. Okay. Yeah, hopefully I get it back a little bit this, this Christmas. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Utica. Um, so you can skip uh, two slides in. 
Excellent. So thank you all for your patience. So a bit of what we'll cover today. Um, we're going to talk through build it, like what a tech portfolio is before we even start, uh, then how to build out your tech portfolio and where to host your portfolio. So a bit of context. Um, I know this audience ranges in age from about 30 to 13 to 29, so which is good. It's never too early to start thinking about your career. Um, but I will try to tailor this for everyone. So we'll start off on some quick tactical things you can do to build out your tech portfolio. And then we'll talk about some more advanced things you can do to stand out. So feel free to ping in the chat how that sounds to you. Great. Um, so for starters, what is a tech portfolio? You can skip to the next slide. A tech portfolio is evidence of your technical abilities. It can comprise of projects and code samples, and it helps you stand out from the crowd to impress potential employers and hopefully land your dream job. So the two key things to take away from here is that it contains evidence, so code or projects, and it helps you stand out from the crowd. So you want it to be a unique collection of things that describe your ability. So, quiz time, uh, which of these are tech portfolios? You can either ping in A, B, C, D, or a combination of any. I like this. Don't be shy. <laughs> I'm not seeing all of them very clearly, but I like C. I'm seeing a few words. Maybe even A. Yeah, so trick question. I would polemically say that all of these are tech portfolios. So I think a LinkedIn is a tech portfolio, um, and I'm going to talk about it in a couple slides. But I would say all of these are. They are, it can be a website, it can be a LinkedIn. It's just a body of work that lives on the internet that describes your abilities. Okay, so some fundamentals of a strong tech portfolio. You should use a catchy headline to stand out. Uh, so if we can see in this example here, web design for good. Up front, it describes exactly what the, the goal of this portfolio is. It says this person's a web designer and they're trying to sell web services. And if you look at the blurb here, um, and they're doing it for good. So if you look at the blurb, she talks about specializing in accessible websites for charities and nonprofits. So it's very clear just by looking at this that it's a person is trying to sell a web design and they're doing it either pro bono or for good, mm -hmm. like for social services. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so the other thing that's important is using professionally appropriate information. So you can see from this photo here, um, this person has their headshot, they look very approachable. Um, they say they are a success coach, so they're trying to sell coaching services. And also you can also list things like testimonials and recommendations and your professional background um, and education certificates. The other key component of a good tech portfolio is a call to action. So if you look at this here, um, you need to give somebody something to do next. So this here says, let's chat about your next project. They list out the email, the phone contact, and a couple of services that they offer. So consulting, web and app design, optimization, and branding. So just make sure you have like you have a call to action and like it's clear to the people reading it what you want what what you want the action to be from them and what you can offer them. Um so now that we have some fundamentals, we can talk about building out your tech portfolio. So like I mentioned, here's my LinkedIn. Um so I would recommend if somebody doesn't have one, you can start easy on LinkedIn. It's free. It's a collection of different resources. So you can create a catchy headline with a call to action and you can list out some of your schooling as well. So 
if you look at what I have here, um, I have three a list of three things. I'd highly recommend three. I have that I am a writer, I'm a data innovator, and a public speaker. So these are all three things that I want you to know about me as soon as you meet me and areas that I'm pursuing and interested in continuing to pursue. And then I have my schooling on the side as well. So it's a nice quick snapshot, which you know, which is great for people to understand what you offer, your services, and how they can leverage you. Um, after that, sorry, I think there's like, I, I see a green squiggly on the screen. I don't know if anyone else can see it. I don't know if you can erase that, Utica. But after that, um, there is a carousel right under the headline where um, you can list out some featured posts. So I actually only started using this feature about a year ago. I highly recommend it if you don't use it. Um, so here I have some talks that I've given, one that I gave a couple months ago on metrics-driven marketing and innovation and experimentation. So this is something that I do in my day-to-day, -day, and it's something that I'm passionate about talking about. So I have it front and center as my first highlight. Uh, my, the next one is a talk that I gave about measuring connected TV. And the third is a talk that I gave last year. So upfront, people know the um, things that I'm passionate about, that I'm, I'm an expert in, and that I talk about. So definitely, I would encourage you to use this to showcase your skills and the areas you want to grow. And if you don't have work experience, you can use it to highlight school projects that you've worked on. So we'll talk about that later, but um, just use it as an area um, to highlight that stuff. And if you go to the next slide, there is also an about me section um, that I would highly encourage using as well. So if you look at the things that I have highlighted in red, thank you. Um, I have that I'm a thought leader and I create measurement frameworks, which is unique. And a lot of people don't do that. I create measurement frameworks to address advertiser concerns. I measures connected TV, digital TV, and I always seek knowledge, feedback, and growth. And to me, going back to the rule of threes that we saw in the previous slide, these are three core things that make me stand out and differentiate me from others. And so I would definitely use your about me section to show the things that you're good at and why you're unique to help you stand out from the crowd. Great. Uh, so next, we have our work experience. So if you look here, I actually have my earliest work experiences here. So on the bottom, it was my first job. Um, I have highlighted that I managed five coordinators, not officially, unofficially, um, and 100 different partners in multiple work streams. So definitely use that type of language to highlight management skills if that's an area that you want to grow in or focus on and cross-functional work. So up front there, I have as my first job management experience. The one after that is actually an internship, which is why I was encouraging folks to highlight internships if they don't have work experience. And I have highlighted that I built a transaction model for a grocery chain. You can list the revenue, um, if you know it, for the chain to show the impact of your work as well. Uh, which is important because you want to not only highlight management or technical experience here, but you also want to highlight the impact that your work has. So um, you can get that from things like their, if the company is public, you can get that from their public disclosures that they have on their website and things like that. And then the third thing here is highlighting another skill like ma marketing experience, which I have highlighted. So in my third role, I mentioned that I increased conversion rates by 10%. So you can estimate that. And so what these three th things show is that I have a background in management, technical, and marketing. And that trifecta helps you, makes you a promising employee, depending on the direction you want to go in. So definitely think about the three key areas that can highlight your skills for a certain role that you're applying for. And then the next really important thing here, if you haven't done this already, or if you don't have a LinkedIn, I would encourage you to add 
skills that either you're good at or you want to grow. And so I added these a years ago and people will come in and they will organically endorse you. Uh, and the next thing is recommendations. So for the internship that I showed in the previous slide, um, you can see here that my boss at this internship wrote, a, wrote me a recommendation. So now everyone can go in and see. So this person managed me directly at this year and they mentioned certain things that I did. I created data models so it verifies what I have on my um, for my experience. And I reached into a data lake. So just by looking at this, they know that I have a technical background. Even if it was from an internship, it's still very advanced. Um, and it's not something you see in a lot of day-to-day -day work. So definitely rec like get recommendations from internships if you need, or definitely colleagues if you need to continue building out your tech portfolio. And then another important thing to keep in mind is choosing a diverse breadth of work to showcase your skills. So like I've mentioned before, you can do it from a collection of school projects, internships, and also work experience. You want to lead with impact, like I showed. So you want to say, I proved X or I accomplished Y. Like I mentioned, like driving 10% increase in click rate or impacting 10 billion in revenue. So lead with outcomes and impact as much as possible upfront. Try to use recent projects and go for quality over quantity. So up until a few years ago, I actually had projects from grad school on here um, just to make sure that I was able to demonstrate to employers that I had certain skills and that they could hire me because I had done this stuff already. So here's an example on the bottom. So I conducted data mining. Uh, can go, yeah, I conducted data mining in R to show that more restaurants receive health violations in the spring. So this was actually a project that I ran in grad school for um, for um, a project to show to looking at a publicly available data set. So the data set that I data mined showed that restaurants tend to receive more health violations in the spring. And once they have a chance to pass, they either pass with flying colors or they're shut down completely. So distilling things into bullet points like this and putting it in your portfolio are really important because it shows that not only do you have the depth of skills to mine the data and get these insights, but you also can package it, package it at a very high level to sell it back to clients or whoever your customer is, whether it's your teacher or someone else. Um, and that can help. This actually helped me get one of my jobs because they were impressed that I not only had technical skills to do this, but also I could distill it to business stakeholders as well. So definitely leverage everything in your arsenal and recency and quality over quantity, I think are the two main takeaways, a couple of takeaways of this slide. Okay, um, where to host your portfolio? I'll go quick because I know we're running up against time, but there are a couple of platforms that you can use. So GitHub is great. I'll show you it in the next slide. It's for code only though. LinkedIn that I just mentioned, and I think once you have your LinkedIn as your foundation, it's your home base, you can then transpose it onto websites. So Wix is a great site that I really like. You can go there and buy your domain, and then you can transpose all of the work that you have in your LinkedIn into Wix. And so typically you do that when you want to sell a service. Like, so we saw somebody was selling coaching services or website design services. So you can leverage these websites for them. But I highly recommend Wix. WordPress is good too. Um, and you don't need to know any HTML coding. They have templates you can use. So on the next slide, here's an example from GitHub. Um, so it's a little bit small, so it might be hard to see, but literally you, any type of code you have, whether it's R or SQL or Python, you can, from either a school project or for work, you can upload it here. Uh, the caveat for work is just making sure that you scrub any personal information from it so you don't get in trouble. But I've definitely had recruiters look at my GitHub, um, and I, I didn't know, but basically to just make sure like that I was a good candidate and it probably helped me get the interview. So definitely leverage GitHub if you have anything to update and link it, link to it in either your website or your LinkedIn or your and your resume, of course. And on the next slide is just a high level sample of Wix. So definitely highly recommend this site. Um, you can easily go in and pick a template that works for you. 
and then stick in your bio, your headshot, like we saw, and a couple um, projects and some of your work experience to help you land your next role. All right, so I think we're exactly at 15 minutes. I'll pause here and can't wait to hear from you in the Q&A. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Candice. Um, so we have time for a few questions. Um, and as people are thinking or typing their questions, as the moderator, I will just ask you a few things. So a GitHub is mainly for code. Can you embed GitHub into any of your other things? Have you done that with Wix or with LinkedIn? Uh, for Wix, I believe you might have a ch an option. I, I that's a great question. I haven't tried that. I believe like you can typically embed code inside. So I think with Wix, you can do that. Okay. Because yeah, and then yeah, you can link many ways of writing, creating even my LinkedIn profile. I I have been not paid any attention to it, but I now will pay attention to it. <laughs> Very important. Lots of leads come through LinkedIn. I've I've experienced that too. So I am waiting to see if there are any 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 questions here. Um, I had a few more questions, uh, Candice, if I can just go ahead and ask you. Um, you said in you know you said you're a data innovator. What do you mean by that in your in your um, uh, CV? Yeah, that's a great question. I um so since I have a minor in creative writing, I like finding creative ways to express myself in data. Um, so what that's meant in the past few years is combining data sources to create new insights. So one example is for Connected TV, which I'm very passionate about. I look through the different YouTube tables in my first couple of years of my role to create a dashboard that showed Connected TV trends. And it was very powerful because a lot of people that I worked with didn't have the skill set to go in and sit down and write that code and make sure it looked good um, to then create to to then visualize it into a dashboard. So I do things like that. Um, I'm actually going to be doing a rotation as a product manager soon, so I'll be I'll be working on building out a product using data. So finding creative ways to leverage data to create new insights or products for people. Okay, great. We ha I have another question for you from Amrita. Uh, Candice, how do you build a portfolio when most of your work are government-based and can't be shared? Yes, wow. um, that's an excellent question. I'm not in government, but I'll do the best to answer that. Um, I think it you, you probably need to get clearance from your legal department. So I'm in the same position. If I share things externally, I need to get it cleared by my PR department. So if you can't share revenue, I mean, I believe the government publishes certain reports so i think align look at look through their public reports that they publish and you can cite that like if you worked on a project that had whatever impact like 10 million dollars in revenue like i worked on this project that had 10 million dollars in revenue and link out to that site so it's clear that you're not leaking any confidential information um or like i worked i don't know what specific fields you work in but like i worked on this project to build this bridge that impacted estimate how many people live in the towns like ex, like impacted sixty thousand people so you can root your accomplishments and assumptions and publicly available numbers that they have to publish let me know if that helps that is a very important answer because i think you spoke about the impact which you, the examples you gave and we often don't put the impacts in our portfolio yes um, Jennifer has a question. As you build your tech portfolio, how important is it to have tech training and certifications? And also another one, do all jobs at Google require tech training? Um, it depends. So to be honest, my first few jobs that I had listed on the slide that I showed, particularly my internship and when I was an analytics manager at an agency, to be honest, I was coding all day at those jobs. I don't code all day anymore. Um, as I mentioned, as you do progress in your career and you move into management, you really should not be doing that. Um, there are tools, especially now with the advent of AI, that can automate a lot of that. Um, and you need to start focusing on people things and like figuring out how do I create a better process for these things to fit together. So you, I, I don't code as much and you use it less and less. Um, 
that was the answer to the second question. So no, not every job. I think if you're a software engineer, then yes, you need to code, but that's given by the title. If you are not, then you, you'd have to do it less, especially as a manager. As that was the answer to the second question about Google. The first question, can you remind me? Um, how important it is to have tech training and certifications or building a tech portfolio? Um, yeah, it depends. Like, I don't, it depends on the role you're targeting again. So if you're becoming, a, if you want to be a software engineer, then absolutely. If you want to be like any type of engineer, but there are many types of tech roles that exist that are non, that are technically non-technical. Like you can be a technical writer and you need to understand systems and infrastructure, uh, but you don't necessarily need to code. And same thing for a product manager as well. Like syst understanding systems design is important, but not knowing how to code necessarily. So I think it depends on your chosen field and what you want to pursue. Okay, and you know we get, you're getting lots of hands up and you know claps from our uh, from the participants in this room. So thank you so much for that insightful, I should say, the actionable insights that you gave us because you are telling us to quantify actionable insights in building the tech portfolio. And I think you gave us some how to even build that up. So I had invited my students, you know, my finalizing students. I hope they are, if some of them are attending and learning how to really build the tech portfolio. So thank you so much, Candice. And, and we welcome you to, you know, the, the CARICOM Girls in ICT and you are a CARICOM Girls in ICT. So congratulations on that. Thank, thank you. you for that insightful presentation. Thank you. Yep. I just, one takeaway, just remember you have to like quantify to make sure to convince people to hire you and why you should and sell yourself. So just remember that. Thank you, everyone. And that's a very important message because often we sell ourselves short. And I think um, in the, I think as women, I think Jennifer has pointed that out to me several times that we do it very often. I'd said something to her and she said, yes, you're a woman. That's why you didn't do this. So um, well, I think you you left us with some very smart words. So um, I don't know if our read next speaker is online. I was told that he is online. So Joshua is no stranger to CARICOM Girls in ICT Steering Committee. And uh, so Joshua Andel is a 19-year-old youth advocate and portfolio entrepreneur who runs three freelance businesses and works as a junior trader at a hedge fund. And he's only 19 years old, wow. He's heavily involved in youth leadership and advocacy, having served as a youth representative on a World Bank and OECS commission panel. He's also a committee member on the Caribbean Girls in ICT Day Steering Committee, a U Report Ambassador, and a member of five different NGO youth groups. As the male CARICOM ambassador for Grenada and a youth advocate, he's proud to represent his country and contribute to regional youth development with the support of several private and public entities. Andal believes that young people have the power to make real changes in the world, and he's committed to doing his part. When he's not working, he enjoys books, um, practices, I, I, you know, mixed martial arts, football, making music, he volunteers whenever possible, and he has volunteered several times. I've seen him um, at the CARICOM ICT committee. He's excited for the future and looks forward to continuing to make a difference in both businesses and advocacy work as the main CARICOM youth ambassador for Grenada. And today he's going to be talking about digital marketing agencies. So over to you, Joshua. I see you online. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Let's see if PowerPoint would like to agree with me today. Yeah, everyone can see the PowerPoint. Let me try to move this bar. Yes, you can just put it in slideshow mode. Okay. Right. So everybody can see the PowerPoint, PowerPoint now. Only the PowerPoint? Yes, only the PowerPoint. You are safe to go. Okay, nice. So, um, the introduction Sorry, are... I could see you. Can you, like, just exclude yourself and just oh. show the PowerPoint? 
Okay. Um, I'm not sure we are, the PowerPoint is on the screen. Can you still see me on the screen? That's usually how when you go in present mode, it normally gives you the small circle with it. Can you still okay. see me? No, I don't see you. Thank you. Okay, um, great. Okay, go ahead, Joshua. All right. So, of course, um, the introduction was already was already done. Um, but I'm not sure. I will, we'll just jump right into it because we have a lot of we have a lot of stuff to get in. So, firstly, why digital marketing? Why did I choose digital marketing? I mean, there are several things that I could have done, but why is it that I choose digital marketing? From an early age, I was captivated by technology. It was just wow, so many things you could do with it. And compared comparing back then, I mean, we could do so much more now. And to me, the idea of simply being able to create something out of nothing, it was like, wow, like I could create a game from scratch or I could create, let's say, I could create a, a poster for a business from scratch. I don't have to do anything, but I have to do a lot. Yes, yeah, so as I as I delved deeper into the realm of STEM, I discovered digital marketing. And what's happening now is that digital marketing, it's growing. It's steadily growing. So about two years ago, I discovered digital marketing and I was like, wow, like what is this? What is this thing? And as I started to do more research, I realized the capabilities and how limitless digital marketing can actually be taking into consideration all of the new technologies that are developing. So I said, I wonder if I can create a career out of this. I wonder if I can create some sort of income because at the time I was unemployed and I would like to say this as well. Although I have a professional job as a junior trader at a hedge fund, I take this much, if not as serious, much more serious than my professional job because this is something that I'm extremely passionate about. And it's something that I 100%, I believe almost anyone can make a career out of it. But the main thing why I choose digital marketing is the flexibility that came along with it. Now I'm able to operate my full digital marketing agency from my cell phone. Anywhere I go, I can edit an ad. Anywhere I go, I can edit a post, I can create a post, I can make, I can contact my team and I only have one person working on my team and I can have conversations with almost anyone. I can do anything from my phone. That, that sort of flexibility, not being able to, okay, see, I have to sit down in an office 24 seven or the ability to go to different sites, the ability to meet different people, that sort of flexibility is what mainly drew me in when it comes to digital marketing. Now, how do you how do you get here? How the different pathways to this sort of career? Firstly, you have formal education, of course. We all know the school system. You can pursue a degree in marketing, digital marketing, or any related field for a solid foundation. And this is the road that most people go. Then second, we have certifications. This is the road, so the second and third roads are what are the roads that I took. You have certifications. You can obtain a certification from platforms like Google Ads. You can obtain it from Meta. You can obtain it from HubSpot. You can obtain it from almost anywhere, Coursera, edX, anywhere you go, just type in digital marketing and actually get certified. And in the long run, you will see why it is you'll be able to get an advantage through these certifications. Thirdly, we have internships or freelancing. Right. So you can do, you can intern at a digital marketing agency. The certification would help you with that. Or you could simply, through the certifications, you could simply start to do your own thing. Take videos, take pictures. And what I started to do is I started to do it for free. So I, I, I went to businesses and I said, hey, would it be possible that I create this, that I manage your account for the first 15 to 30 days for free? And Possibly after that, we can see if there's any if there's any 
way that we can develop some sort of retainer or if there's any way that you would, that you would want to pay me um, monthly or quarterly for this kind of service. And finally, we have mentorships. You can find someone who is in the field. You can find a photographer. You can find a digital marketing strategist. You can find even a marketing special specialist. You can find them and just ask them, hey, can I hang with you? Or hey, can I have conversations with you once a week, et cetera? I have someone in the digital marketing field um, that I look up to, two individuals actually. They run a, a really successful digital marketing agency here in Grenada. Corey and Cameron, they own digital growth. And every time we get a chance, we'll be able to have a conversation and we'll discuss at length the possibilities for digital marketing here in Grenada, in CARICOM, and just simply on, on a wild, on a, on a larger scale, the world. So the mentorships it really, really, it really helped me when it came to when, when it came to understanding where I am, where I'm going to be, and understanding the mistakes that they made and how not to make it. I've simply fast tracked my success in this industry through simply having mentorships. Now, how did I get here? I took the second, third, and fourth routes. However, I would recommend not necessarily focusing on one. A combination of all of them is essential because you can, because uh, we all know the importance of building a portfolio. When you get the certification or the formal education, you do the internships and freelancing, you build your portfolio, you get a mentor that would help you to basically fast track your success and decrease the amount of mistakes that you make. Now, we're going to look at what it took the skills as well as the challenges. Now, the skills. The main skill is creativity and innovation. Now, I would, I would give you guys a little bit of an insight when it comes to how I operate my digital marketing agency. Now, at first, it was just me doing every single thing. And when I got my foot, when I got my second client and I got my first my first check, I was able to use the creativity and be innovative in how I'm going to move forward. Because what took you to one point in a business venture or in your career would not take you to another point. You would have to be able to adapt. No, I was able to say, hey, there are people out there that can do what I am doing much better than I am doing it. So why should I waste time right now when I've already learned it, when I can effectively communicate what it is a business is looking for to them and the people who are already better than me, I take a percentage of what I am making and I pay it to them. So through that creativity and innovation, I don't do anything except review posts and communicate with business owners now in my agency. Why? because I was able to be innovative in the way that I was moving my business forward. Now, this is something that you would need wherever you are. Whatever career you're in, your ability to be innovative and creative will take you so much further in your career. And of course, you have analytical thinking. I was able to leverage data-driven insights to optimize digital marketing strategies. For example, by analyzing behaviors, user behaviors on specific clients' accounts, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, I was able to identify key areas for improvement. For example, there was a business that I was working with and we, we were simply having a consultation and they were, they were like, you know what? I don't really think digital marketing is for me. I don't need this. <laughs> what am I going to do with this? I mean, I could create an Instagram account and post it, et cetera, on my own. So we had a we had a we had an agreement. They were going to continue posting on their own, and I was going to analyze what they were doing and show them why what they're doing was not resonating with their target audience. And that is exactly what I did. Through my analytical thinking, I was able to take all of the insights from Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, wherever, whatever social media accounts the client were using and I was able to say hey you can see that your watch time is less than 30 minutes and this has been up for 30 days although reels would be anywhere from 30 seconds to one minute in digital marketing 30 minutes is a really small time 
I would be able to be like, hey, out of 500 people that view you, that viewed your post, you only have five likes. So that kind of analytical thinking and being able to combine the different data that I was collecting on the back end, I was able to show them and be able to land clients and even build my expertise through that. And thirdly, we have time management. Now, as you can see, I'm involved in a lot, but time management is something that even before I started my agency, it was something that I drilled down to myself and I said, hey, I need to be able to manage my time. In a business, or in a career, several things, it's in your head, several things are in the world. It's, I'm not even sure how to describe it, especially if you're, if you're, if you're pursuing something as a career, so you can have two, three deadlines at the same time. I have to figure out, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? And if you're not able to manage your time effectively, one would lapse over the other. You would be able to, you would be missing deadlines and that would look, that would reflect extremely bad on you to your employer. And now we're moving on to challenges. Now, the main challenge that I had was juggling multiple roles. I was able to manage my time effectively, but juggling multiple roles was something that was a bit difficult for me. The trading responsibilities, managing the businesses, the youth advocacy, it's difficult for me to switch from one role to another. So I'd be speaking to one of my youth youth advocates and I would still be in trading mode. I would be on work and I would still be in youth advocacy mode, in a, in a youth advocate mode. So the juggling multiple roles kind of, yeah, it kind of was a bit difficult for me. Secondly, we have adapting to industry changes. And I spoke to this a bit earlier, flexibility. Now I'll give you guys another example. In my business, in my business, I never used to use artificial intelligence. However, the industry changed and many other businesses did not adapt to it. And I saw an opportunity where I can firstly decrease the amount of work that I was doing and decrease the amount of works that my workers were doing. And I said to myself, I was like, hey, why not get more or why not adapt to the change in industry and jump into artificial intelligence? And that is exactly what we did. And as a result, we're able to schedule an entire two months worth of content within 30 minutes. So I schedule two months worth of content for my clients and I don't have to work for the next, I don't have to do anything strenuous or heavy for the next two months for that specific client. Why? Because I was able to adapt to the change in industry and incorporate it. Um, alongside with this, I would couple it with being extremely perceptive. And finally, overcoming rejection in advocacy. And I took this, I said in advocacy, because I was able to say, I was able to take how many times I got rejected in advocacy, how I handle it to be able to incorporate it in this career. Now, when you're pursuing a career, you would, you would get told no several times, more than once. But how you respond to that, as someone like a motivational speaker now, how you respond to that is the thing that's extremely important, is the thing, is what will set you apart from your other competitors, is what will set you apart and ensure your success. I have been told no so many times. There was this one specific client um, that I was working with when I started my career. I was, she told me no probably 50 times. And I just kept coming back. And she was like, you know what? Let's just try it once. Or sometimes they tell you no, but in a different way. They say, you know what? I don't think no is the right time for me. Or they say, you know what? I don't think I should do this right now, etc. And being able to overcome that rejection or being able to say, okay, I understand, or being able to give solutions and alternatives, it's extremely important. And that is, that is one of the major challenges that I faced. Now, what are some of the lessons that I've learned? Through my journey, I've gained invaluable lessons. The first one is the importance of adaptability. 
that I alluded to this at the top as well. If you're not able to adapt to what's going on in the market, you would be left behind. I know of a friend of mine who has a digital marketing agency and they are just, they don't want to switch over to the no new kind of dominating. The main thing that digital marketing agencies would use would be Canva. And they don't want to switch over to Canva. They don't want to switch over to artificial intelligence. And as a result of that, the quality of the content has significantly decreased because they are competing in the market against individuals. Uh, you in a career would be competing against different individuals who are adapting to the market and increasing the quality of the content that they are producing. And as a result of that, your content, what you're producing as an employee, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, would look subpar compared to them. So being able to adapt is so very important. Secondly, we have communication. I cannot stress this enough. I cannot stress this enough. No, I'm going to give you guys a little personal example here as well. And I think I thought it was funny when I was creating this PowerPoint. And I remember I, I had I had a younger brother. Sorry, have. <laughs> I moved out. So that's why I said have. I have a younger brother. And every single time he would be on me, he would be like, yo, bro, like let me go and make a line. Or he'd be like, yo, bro, can we go do this? Every single time he would be asking me to do stuff, asking me to do this. And I would see messages and I would see the text and I'd be like, ah, I'll answer when I get the chance. However, most times I just forgot to answer. And as a result, at that specific time in my life, it really damaged the relationship that I had with my brother. Now, if I was able to effectively communicate and be like, um, I'm sorry, but today won't be the best time. Let's do it for tomorrow. Or let's move it for next week. But I haven't forgotten, etc. That sort of communication would have been much better. It would have been able to save my relationship with him at the time. Now, my brother and I are actually cool now. Don't get <laughs> we're, we're actually cool now. We fixed it. But that's just an ex that's just an example. And through that, I was able to say, hey, I understand now what's going on. If I'm not able to effectively communicate with a potential client or a client, every single thing or every single important thing, I'm not able to keep that client. If you're not able to effectively communicate with your peers in a career, if you're not able to effectively communicate to your boss, you would be at a disadvantage. If you're sick and you can't communicate how, how sick you are, if you're having a problem at work and you can't communicate how frustrated you are in a respectful way, you would be at a disadvantage. And lastly, of course, resilience has been my greatest asset. I have been told no many times, but I never give up. I've been told, Digital marketing won't work many times. I've been told digital marketing is going downhill many times. However, I was extremely resilient. The first three months in launching my agency, I had zero dollars. I launched my agency with exactly negative $163.98. That's how I launched my agency. In a career, you would be told no many times. You would be, for example, working on a project and you'd realize, hey, this, 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 this is not going to work. Uh, you would be working with some employees and they would be like, so very difficult. I know some of you have probably worked in group projects already and it was so difficult. I know I've had my fair share of terrible group projects. But yeah, but how resilient you are and coupled with your effective communication would be able to allow you to stand out when it comes to your career, especially digital marketing. So many times my computer had been shut down, shut down on me. And I was sitting there like, how am I gonna, in the start and I was like, how am I gonna schedule the post for my client? My computer is shut down. What did I do? I went to my phone and I started to do research how it is exactly that I could do all of this. How it is that I could, for possibly find another way and I did. I found out that there was an app that I could use. I downloaded the app and I communicated with my client, hey, we're switching to this app 
for a short space of time so you can come over here and review and and review your posts and let me know which and let me know any sort of edits or any sort of pointers that you have if i was not resilient i would have been like you know what the computer shut down and communicates to the clients hey um my computer shut down and i can't really schedule the post now although they would have been understanding Hi, i'm so sorry yes your computer shut down that's an IT issue. Can we move on to the next point, please? Okay, no problem. Actually, Joshua, just look at your messages. I think we're running out of time. Joshua, you're on mute. Yeah, apologies. So I would end by giving you some tips. I would like you to stay curious and keep learning. Secondly, to build a diverse skill set. And third, network and collaborate. Now, that's the end of my presentation. I Now I'm wondering if you guys have any questions for me. Sure. Thank you so much for that, Joshua. Um, you know, you've given us your journey, which was very useful uh, for young people uh, who are trying to build a career. I think you, for me, you said a very um, important thing about technology, that one has to be a lifelong learner. And you, and, 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 and the important thing is that from, from us who are, who are probably already made a career into something, you can always learn a new skill and, uh, so I, I'm just, uh, you know, the floor is open for any questions if people have in the chat. And as they post their questions, I'll ask you, you have done a lot of certifications. How do you find the right certification for the right skill? Because there's so many around. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. No, you're, you're right. There are many certifications out there. But in short, I would say, find out exactly what it is you want to do you can write it down um some goals what exactly you want to get from a certification and through that you would be able to see the course outline and basically what you would get the lessons you would learn from that and you would be able to kind of match that up with all of the different courses out there and as a result you'd be able to find the perfect course for you in whatever career that it is you're trying to go after i hope that helped Okay, and thank you for that. And I think in the interest of time and trying to finish on time, um, there are no questions. So um, thank you everyone for attending these two uh, interesting talks. And next week we will have another STEM STEAM career webinar series will continue. So over to you, Jennifer, to give the closing remarks. And, and as Jennifer comes in, I would really like to thank Candice and Joshua for giving really insightful talks. Thank you, Gunjan. I'm sorry we didn't have more time, but certainly we will be sharing the recordings via our website. And I too want to thank you and uh, Candice and Joshua for doing very um, wide ranging uh, presentations and for bringing it to us in a small amount of time. I'm sure that we will have more questions and we will continue to have the conversation next week. So even if you have questions from this week, perhaps you can bring them back next week and we can have the conversation follow up. I did have a few for um, Joshua myself, but I will save them since I know where to find him. But I think we do have, we did have a good uh, spread it brings the work of the partnership uh, front and center in the sense and the digital skills task force as we uh, ruminate and work as a region as to how to uh, pull certifications into our space just as uh, meaningfully as formal education. So I think it was a good um, bit of touch points today dealing with those issues and hopefully we can continue the conversation as the series goes on. We do have five more weeks until the um, end of November where we will be meeting with you and discussing uh, various aspects based on various themes. So please check our website 
uh, by Monday or Tuesday for next week's speakers and their themes so that you can be uh, equally engaged and engaging as an audience for next Friday. Thank you all again for taking your time. I know this is a lunchtime uh, session, so thank you again for devoting some of your lunch and lunching through work with us. Thank you again, Gunjan, and I look forward to uh, next week's presentations and the um, continued participation of all the audience and uh, members of the partnership are there as they are on today. And special thanks again, if I haven't said it, to uh, all the other persons who work behind the scenes, our technical teams, and everybody else who uh, does the work to pull this all together. And to the speakers again, many, many, many thanks for volunteering and for giving us these moments and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you all and have a good weekend.